Most governments, multilateral organizations, and the private sector across the world usually resort to borrowing to bridge revenue shortfalls and infrastructure financing. Well, in Nigeria, the swelling debt profile without a commensurate infrastructure development uh, has become a great concern to many Nigerians with Debt Management Office projecting that Nigeria's total debt stock will hit 77 trillion naira by June 2023, saying returning the uh, economy to the path of sustainable growth demands that certain fundamentals must be gotten right. Well, let's talk more around this. I introduced him earlier. He is the Managing Director and Chief Business Officer with uh, Optimus by Afri Invest, Mr. Ayo Deji uh, Ebo. Thank you so much. Mr. Ebo, it's good to see you. Good afternoon, and thanks for having me. Well, I, I will start with a regular question and everyone want to ask. How worried are you as at December, 46.25 trillion naira is the debt? That's where we stand. I know it's, I think it's more than that at the moment. But how worried are you with this figure as it continues to increase? Okay, thanks. I think everyone should be worried uh, because if you look at it based on what is on ground is highly unsustainable. Uh, it's, um, it's like a ticking bomb. Um, it's, it's really concerning because there's really no structure that we can see in place or in sight on how this would be repaid. What you see is just the growth rate has been very, very significant and can be scary at times when you look at it. So um, you are wondering uh, how, when you look at the rate at which it's growing relative to where how um, the revenue is also trying to catch up. So looking at from 2015, for instance, when you have it at 12.6 trillion, and now like almost times four at 46.3. And we know this is as of December, 2022. We all know the deficit in the budget is significant. Is between when you look at projection, almost about eleven between eleven and thirteen trillion. So, and you can see that there are still revenue challenges. So, I think it's really very concerning, such that all our revenue, even projected, will no longer, as we progress, will no longer be able to service our debt. And when you look at debt servicing, is not about paying necessarily paying down on those debts is just keeping them active, paying the normal coupon that you're supposed to pay, the interest based on agreement. And you just feel that this is not sustainable because if we come together as a country and we plan a budget and we use all the projected revenue, which is like the hard work of everyone in our year to service debts or even to borrow to service debts, then it's, um, it's really very concerning. So I think I would also align with everyone. I know even for the new government, it's it's going to be like the elephant in the room. What would need to be discussed on how this can be sustained. But many would also argue that the last few years have been full of shocks. COVID-19, from COVID-19 shocks to uh, even the war in Russia and Ukraine. And now we see what's happening globally with inflation, uh, global markets, and uh, markets, dis a lot of disconnect here and there. So some would say, well, countries had no choice than to get borrowing. Okay, thanks. That's a valid point that with the current situation, we have no choice to get borrowing, uh, to borrow. But we we'll also look at what are we also doing on the other hand that will be able to repay back. So countries that are also borrowing significantly, they are putting policy and structure in place such that the potential to increase revenue generated by that country would increase and will be able to pay down on the loans, not just based on trying to print money to pay down on loans. So when you look at our own, yes, very interesting uh, documents around the economic growth plan, you look at documents around um, the uh, our economic sustainability, but nothing, nothing significant is happening. Uh, if you look at the capital importation data, FDI has dropped. I think for the year, dropped to uh, six uh, about uh, three hundred sixty-four million dollars, 
which is really very low when you look at it in the last 10 years. So we're not seeing any investment that will begin to translate into more income that will give the potential for government to pay. That is where the concern is. Then beyond that, for us, when you look about the borrowing, where are we putting the borrowing? Where are we channeling it into? Is it into productive sector that will be able to generate things that will be able to repay in the future or generate revenue that will be able to repay? For us, some you are not able to even account for the debt. So when you are using part of the borrowed fund to also service debt, or you are using it to pay largely pay salaries, then there's really, really no potential. It's like you are just throwing the debt down the drain. There's really no potential to recoup anything from the fund. So the concern that we need to face is while we would say, yes, we still need to borrow for us to uh, be able to get out of or get, uh, achieve an optimal growth level. It is what we are borrowing for that is really concerning. And when we look at if we don't see Nigeria as a business, most times when you have challenges in growing your revenue as a business, then you look at how you want to cut down your costs, even if it's temporarily, for you to stabilize before you now increase those costs. So there's a lot that needs to be done. There's a lot that, um, that's, there's a lot of structural issues that needs to be taken care of for in terms of even our. Mm. Uh, there's also the latest $800 million that is generating comments from all and sundry well, that should be used to cushion the effect of subsidy removal uh, when it's finally taken away. And many are saying that that really is not the way to go. Uh, I saw some documentations and uh, all of the management of the funds taken even a huge chunk out of that money. Uh, what do you make of this $800 million uh, plans to cushion the effect of subsidy removal? Okay, thanks. Uh, the, the, there needs to be more articulated plan around the subsidy removals. The funds, which based on what um, is in the news, that it will, there will be just palliatives trying to just give money to people to reduce, to cushion the impact. I feel this is it's, it's as good as not removing it because it's like, it's a waste. You have to, there needs to be a deliberate effort in terms of channeling the savings from subsidy into capital expenditure, into things that would generate long-term cash flow for the economy. We've done, we've, we've seen how we seed um, projects, like project like the Sukuk, that you're able to identify would push in the effect. If you are just paying, we've seen, you know, we also need to look at our peculiarity. We've seen how palliatives have been handled and the accountability around it. So going that route is as good as not even removing it because uh, now it's going to be like double whammy. It's being removed. Uh, Nigerians are paying significantly through their nose for, um, for high, uh, due to high cost of fuel. And at the end of the day, we cannot also trace the impact of the savings because that's even the fear of most Nigerians. Most people will not support this subsidy. We know our consumption, our true consumption will reflect when you remove subsidy, we will stop funding neighboring countries when we remove subsidy and there will be more savings for the government. But the concern is what will the savings be used for? Hmm. Big question. What will the savings be used for? Mr. Ebo, let me ask you this question. There is something called fiscal responsibility law. Now, are we borrowing in compliance to that law? I know this is a rhetorical way. You all know that uh, we are, <laughs> so since in the last five, six years, we have not been complying. When you look at the Fiscal Responsibility <laughs> Act, we are not supposed to borrow more than 50% of last year's uh, revenue. 
and it should even be paid back before a new borrowing can be made. But when you look at the ways and means, it has been accumulating. So it means that we have not been paying back or we pay back little and borrow more. So it's been growing significantly. And so uh, in terms of that uh, Fiscal Responsibility Act, I'm not sure we are, we are not in compliance. It's not like I'm not sure. We know we are not in compliance of that. Yes, there, there was also some adjustment around looking at the revenue as a proportion, looking at revenue as a proportion of uh, our GDP. Uh, debt uh, as a proportion of GDP, which, which was adjusted to about 40%. But when you look at it, currently we're around 22%. Yes, I can hear you. Yes, yeah, so which was around 22.8%. So it looks like we're in a good position, but like we would always say, you are not going to pay debt out of GDP. If our GDP is not productive, if we are not able to optimize our GDP for us to be able to earn revenue from it, then there's no point trying to benchmark your debt to GDP because at the end of the day, GDP is not what you would use to pay it. You need to benchmark it against realizable revenue. And when you look at it, based on last year, it's almost approaching 100%. So this year, we feel it would even exceed 100%. And the more we continue to accumulate that, that would also reduce the effectiveness of the budget. Because when you think um, government is planning, especially if we're talking about federal government here, it's budget, and you know that all the revenue that will be made from oil and non-oil will be used to service debt, then you, you will just be concerned that there's even nothing that would impact on the entire populace. Well, let me also ask that address economic direction and debt sustainability. Many said to sustain this debt depends on the policies of the incoming administration. What are these policies? What should we be looking at? Okay, thanks. I think the quick one that we're talking about is the gradual the, or the removal of subsidies that um, will reduce. Uh, the borrowings, because if we look at it in detail, it means that we have even been borrowing to pay subsidies. So you you see it's like a double whammy. Secondly, the new administration needs to work on insecurity. That's also like a quick win. Once kidnapping reduces and insecurity reduces, there will be more inflow of direct investments. And that would increase the ability of the government to also generate revenue. That uh, is based on making strategic decisions and not necessarily about throwing money or buying equipment. It is trying to ensure that um, I'm talking to the right parties and ensure that we have peace in the country that will attract investment. We may also look at our, our, our exchange rate policy, maybe a review to see that the gap is also reduced so that we can also get more foreign portfolio investors into the country. So I think these are like quick wins because I'm talking about major, and when there are policies that would attract private investors, uh, you know, once you take care of insecurity, private investor, there'll be a bit of a boost in confidence, and you come up with policy that will also protect them, their investments. Uh, there need to be a, rig a rigging of the, uh, public-private uh, partnership act such that there's protection uh, for private sector that is trying to invest and partner with the government. These are those things that um, government don't have that capacity, that money to invest in any project. Uh, Infraco is also there. If government can also ensure that that also starts and they're able to mobilize private capital so that that be that company can focus on infrastructure. So it's about creating the enabling environment, just in summary, uh, that will not cost more. Yes, in terms of policy formulation, yes, you still need to spend more money, but it's not going to be as significant as trying to just continue to throw money at the problem. Mm. Finally, before I let you go, if we continue with business as usual and things continue to roll this way, 
What sort of an economy do you see uh, uh, moving on? Okay, thanks. I think that um, it will the economy will become unbearable because mm. once things are not working, insecurity would increase. If some companies are not setting up, if demand is going down, everyone will be desperate and insecurity would increase. And as a result, even the little revenue that government feel they are making, that can also be impacted. And um, that, I, I don't want to imagine us just continuing at this level. Uh, we are hoping that with the new, new when the new administration comes in, um, you say it that's already down, there's no call. So it's easier for us to begin to look up even from here to see how we want to put things in place that can begin to put us on that upward trajectory. Mm. I must thank you so much, Mr. Ayodeji, Ebo Chief Business Officer, Managing Director, Optimus by Afri Invest. Do I enjoy the rest of your day? Always my pleasure. Thank you for having me.